Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you for having me here in Sydney. Thank you to all of the organizers. Thank you to the other speakers, and thank you to the hosts. Uh, I've been carried through the last two weeks down under by a power greater than myself, uh, and you've all been the channel for that. In January 1992, I was rifling around somewhere in my parents' house. I'd had the best part of a bottle of whiskey. It was the middle of the night. And I found a file. And in the file was a set of papers. And I soon realized the papers were uh, notes written by my brother when he was at university. Uh, He studied philosophy. And they were his philosophy notes. And interleaved in these philosophy notes were letters he'd written in the middle of the night and didn't send. Once he'd read them back the next morning before posting them, he clearly decided these can't be sent. And there was a point of identification because I spent a lot of my drinking writing letters to people in the middle of the night and then not being able to send them when I read them back the next morning. This was in the days before email. (laughs) and in one of the letters he wrote about his drinking and he felt like he was sitting on top of of a volcano and the only thing which stopped the volcano was erupting was alcohol And that's why he was continuing to drink the way he was drinking, despite the consequences, despite the effects on everyone else. And an alcoholic, my brother, was talking to me and I was identifying. And I'd spent a lot of my life being sent to helping professionals who did their best to help. And I wrestled, I mean, just the same as I wrestled with God, but I wrestled with these professionals, and I was evasive and elusive and quick-footed. But I couldn't argue with identification, because I was sitting on top of a volcano, and the the only thing stopping the volcano from erupting was alcohol. Now, the added twist to this was that I'd only ever met my brother once. He'd come to my house. He was 20 years older. He'd come to my house when I was around seven. He'd come to stay. He spent the weekend drinking whiskey and smoking. My parents kept me away from him. I was introduced to him for 10 seconds and then kept in another part of the house. Um, When he was 20, 28, 29, he committed suicide as an alcoholic, I discovered 20 years later through an extraordinary coincidence that he'd been a member of AA and had slipped. And something happened that night. There was no further barrier between me and the truth. The last barrier had dropped, and I knew what I was. I knew that this was going to kill me. And there's a great line in Bill's story, fear sobered me for a bit. And fear did effectively sober me for a bit, but I drank again. There is a very simple message to that little story, which is that self-knowledge will not keep me sober. And when I start again, I don't know how much I'm going to drink and what's going to happen. So I can't even have a... I, I had slips after I came to AA for six months. And I could never tell how long the slip was going to last. I could never tell what was going to happen. There was one slip I got arrested, another where I I was run over. There is no such thing as a safe slip for me. 
So I must never, ever have another alcoholic drink in my life. But I am going to. That's step one for me. And the unmanageability of my life, it's funny, they don't mention the word unmanageable, unmanageability in the big book until, bang, suddenly it's in there on page 59, like a whole chapter after they've finished talking about step one. Now they tell us that there's this element of unmanageability. Um, and that dash, uh, there are different interpretations and people are allowed to disagree on this. That, that no one has to leave the room, it's fine. <laughs> I literally teach punctuation for a living. Part of, <laughs> they pay me to know this stuff. So one of the uses of the M dash is to... Uh, introduce the goods ordered in the first half of the sentence. So if I'm powerless over alcohol, ta-da, my life is unmanageable. <laughs> um, what this means to me, if I can't pick when I'm going to drink, if I can't pick how much I'm going to drink, and if I can't pick what I'm going to do when I've had a drink, then I'm not in charge of the course of my life, something else is. And yes, I may be neurotic, I may be immature, I may be incompetent, I may be nasty, but that is not my unmanageability. I've had serene, pleasant, vegetarian, jogging sponsees who, <laughs> who know that because of the yoga and the alfalfa sprouts, they're going to live to 120 as long as they stay away from the first drink, but they can't stay away from the first drink. So the course of their life is not in their hands. If I don't have the power to turn the steering wheel, I cannot manage the course of the car. And it's so interesting that Fred's story, pages 39 to 43 of the big book, presents him as this um, disgustingly successful person who's had a great day. <laughs> and yet he drinks again because his life is unmanageable. And there's a clue. He talks, in retrospect, about his life before the psychic change and the life after. And he says, although my life was by no means a bad one, he wouldn't exchange that old life for the new one. So he couldn't even identify what was wrong or what was missing. But there was something wrong with the picture. Like in The Matrix when uh, he sees the cat twice and has this deja vu and he, he senses that there's something wrong here. That shouldn't happen. You know, in The Matrix, they're inside this massive computer program. I'm inside a massive computer program created by my own mind and I'm calling it reality. And there is this deep sense that there is something wrong, that I'm never going to fix it. I'm never going to make it okay. And drink offers me a trap door out of that world into a realm where for a few seconds or a few minutes or a couple of hours, my mind lets me rest. And then I'm back in it again. And unless that psychic change happens, and a psychic change, that's, the big book is great but the terminology can be confusing. And psychic change, what it means is my whole mind has to change. And I spent the first few years in AA using AA's 12 steps and using my sponsor and using some Al-Anon principles and using some uh, family of origin work and some in a child, and so all sorts of wonderful tools and religion, uh, like blaring from all speakers. I, I was very uh, uh, ostentatiously devout for a while. I used all of those wonderful tools, and there's nothing wrong with them. They're great and they're necessary, but I was using them to fix my imaginary world to try to operate more effectively in the material world, to try to get on with people better. I wasn't changing the software. I was fixing some of the bugs. 
and all along there was this deep sense of unease. I'm not there yet, and I don't think I'm ever going to get there. And wherever there is, was stretching. You know those nightmares where the end of the corridor stretches further and further in the distance, the faster you run towards it? I got to a point at eight years sober when I realized that I was never going to reach the end of the corridor. And that's when drink styles just seemed like a good idea again. I don't know if any of you have seen Stranger Things. If you haven't, hopefully you've seen The Matrix. <laughs> if you haven't seen either of those, just talk to someone in the break. I haven't got time to... I was in an upside-down world, years in AA, surrounded by other people in an upside-down world co-signing my vision of reality. You have no idea you're in an upside-down world. You have no idea you're in the matrix unless someone from outside the matrix comes into the matrix and tells you, you know there's something else. There is somewhere else. This is not the only thing on offer. A friend of mine says uh, about the desert, when you're in the desert, leave the desert. Don't try and get the desert to bloom. He adds, don't tell the Israelis. The, the, that's the whole thing. But that's a, different, that's a different matter. An Israeli friend told me that, actually. <laughs> But going to meetings at seven, eight years sober with a life I envied. I actually envied me my own life. I had what I wanted, but I was no less full of fear than I had been the day I came to AA with nothing, with mental illness, with, with everything. Uh, it wasn't burnt to the ground. I didn't have anything to burn to the ground. I just started drinking at an early age and stayed drunk until the age of 21. I'm 48 now. Um, and I'd go to meetings and people would say, keep coming back. Up your meetings. Do some more service. Um, I was struggling with some emotional stuff when I was, like, whatever, some stuff when I was 21, 22 years sober. And I was in, uh, I was in Arizona, and my friend Kurt was there. And I was telling him about the situation that was bothering me. And I looked into his eyes, and nothing quivered, nothing shook. There was just this solidity there, and I knew there was a different way to look at things. And I've had this experience again and again and again throughout my recovery. But starting from about eight, nine, ten years, finding people who lived in a different reality but had their feet in this one so they could communicate with me. There's a great line in the big book about having your head on the clouds with God and your feet on the earth, which is where your, your work is. Um, the point of all of the steps for me is to enable me to access that reality so that I can breathe at last. And once I can breathe, I don't need to drink. That's what this is about for me. You have to say that. Um, Now, I always like to skip ahead. I don't want to have to do the work. So you tell me on page 63, you never need to drink again if you know, on 199, if you keep your hand in the hand of God, um, uh, if you stay close to God and perform his work well, you're going to be fine. And for the first eight years in AA, I kept my nose pretty clean, honestly. I, I cleaned up my mess. I made the amends. I did all sorts of uh, things to expand my life. I had a few sponsees. 
but I was trying to skip ahead. I couldn't fully give myself in my heart to a power greater than myself. I couldn't give up my old thinking system because I still had a plan. I was still busy with my own stuff. And the reason step four, I believe, comes immediately after step three is that I have no hope in hell. I, I, I play acted doing God's will for eight years, but I was trying to do God's will because I thought it was in my own best interest. It would help me achieve everything I needed to achieve to be okay. The point about step four for me is to identify the fact that I have bet on the wrong horse. So it tells me in a really general way on page 61 that, um, well, here's the question. Is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest happiness and satisfaction from this world if he only manages well? It's quoted last night. And I was convinced if I was nice to people, if I was kind, if I learned how to relate properly to my mother, if I get a career, if I get a house, if I get a mortgage, if I get a pension, if I get a relationship, if I get a social life, if I go on holiday, if I get the right CDs, if I have the right music surrounding me the whole time, if I had, there was this endless list of things that needed to be a particular way and then there'd be a loud pop and I'd be okay. And most of these things were perfectly good. But I would read that line year after year and not see the word delusion in it. I knew I was a, a victim of the idea that I could rest happiness and satisfaction from this world if I only manage well. But I had no idea it was a delusion. And when I started to see the word delusion there, and a life run on self-will can hardly be a success, the trouble is with these phrases, they're repeated so often, so regularly, that they lose their meaning. So, like with how it works, because it's read at every meeting. You never listen to it. It's completely blanched and bleached of any meaning. But a life run on self-will can hardly be a success. Put in ordinary English means, what you want will kill you. If you want it, you know, they say... <laughs> You know, you have to listen to your heart and you have to uh, go after your dreams. And your heart, yeah, if you can find it. <laughs> but there are lots of louder voices than the heart that say, Hi, I'm your heart. This is what we're going to do. And if my heart wants anything in the material realm, thinking that something in the material realm can positively or even negatively affect the level of my actual experience at the level of mind and spirit, which is a level above that, if I think that anything down here can affect anything up there, I'm backing the wrong horse. That's not the way round things work. So, you want a career, great. You know that's not going to make you happy. You want a relationship, fine. You know that's not going to make you happy. And the result of actually sitting with those ideas, whatever you want is not going to make you happy, the result of sitting with that is so horrific. The despair is so great. The ego just deletes the questions and says, let's not get lost in morbid reflection. <laughs> My ego has been to every single AA meeting I've been to. It's heard every tape. My ego has done A Course in Miracles. It knows how to use this stuff against me. And you're back at square one again. So... In step three, I concede in a general way that running after sex and money and power and prestige and comfort and thrills and appearance is not going to fix me. But I haven't been convinced at gut level. 
I mean, I had the evidence when I was 18, and yet at 28, 29, I was still playing the same song. When I, when I was 18, my whole childhood was a, a catastrophe. Um, I think from the outside, lots of it looked okay, but from the inside, it wasn't. I had a spectacular nervous breakdown at the age of 14, uh, where I was, um, I was a chorister at Salisbury Cathedral, and uh, I saw this huge black bird flying down the middle of the nave, and I don't remember anything for three or four days. Um, I was not right before I ever drank. And my whole life as a teenager, I went to a specialist music school, uh, was based on music. And I won something. I won the opportunity to play a concerto with an orchestra, a piano concerto with an orchestra when I was 18. And about four minutes in, my mind blanked and I lost 20 seconds and I got back into it and we just lost 20 seconds of a half hour piece. But I, the rest of it, the remaining 26, 27 minutes was hell. I wasn't even there. I couldn't enjoy the one thing I'd spent my whole life working towards. And literally nothing else was important to me and I messed it up. But the truth is, if I hadn't messed it up, it would have been just as bad. There were other things which I've achieved. Exactly. The plan worked out and nothing happened. There was no click. But I needed to do this across my whole life in step four for it to sink in at gut level and to me to push, for me to push away that whole way of living with disgust and without the slightest shred of regret that I would be losing anything by dropping all the plans. So step four, I'm going to be talking about step four. I'm going to be talking about step five. Um, Step four in the big book is divided, if you don't know, by the way, that's where they put the instructions. Um, no one told me this for a long time. We referred to the big book, but basically your sponsor told you what to do, and if you couldn't sleep, you would read the big book. And then tell everyone the next day at the meeting, I couldn't sleep, so I read the big book and everyone laughed. <laughs> but I didn't use it as a systematic, as a systematic tool. There are three inventories, and in the first inventory, there are two elements, There's or two written elements. There's a third element which people miss. But the first element is these so-called columns, these three columns where I say, okay, who's upset me? And it's not just resentment. It, it's, it's who I feel threatened by, who I feel hurt by, who I feel injured by, who I feel interferes with my life. I, I, I think in some ways was too well brought up to believe that I was actually resentful because it was so suppressed. But I just knew I, I was just disappointed. I was just <laughs> saddened. <laughs> because I knew how much better things could be. I mean, boiling rage at some level deep down within, which explains all sorts of the awkward behavior in other areas of my life, which I compartmentalized and pretended wasn't there. But on the surface, I was just quietly saddened. Anyway, you do a list of all the people, and you nail the charges. What's the charge against them? And I mean, there may be a story. There may be a whole history. But the charge has to be clear. What is the problem? The problem is, for instance, you know, complex relationship. The problem is, he left me. No huge story. That's the problem. And then in the third column, I get to ask, well, why does this bother me? Why are all of these things in the world upsetting me? And I heard step fives. I did a step five when I was in my first few months, and I heard step fives for years where people said, you know, I'm angry at Jennifer. Why? Because she set fire to my hair. This affects my pride, my self-esteem, my personal relations, my sex relations, my ambitions, security, and pocketbooks. And they just repeat this thing 
they, you just say, say the words again and again and again, and it's supposed to do something like a magical incantation. But there is no actual understanding, and you want to shake people and say, what do you mean? But no one's allowed to ask. You just have to do what it, you know, keep it simple, stupid. So don't ask questions around here. You know, God gave the writers of the big book brains to think, but that doesn't apply to you, sweetheart. Uh, that whole attitude, that whole approach to A has never worked with me. There is a tone which does not work with me, and that's the tone. Um, I got to ask questions, and I got to read it for myself. I got to think about it for myself. I got to listen to tapes, to read all sorts of things, to talk to people other than my sponsor. And I started after a few years in AA to find some solutions. It felt my whole life until I did my first real in-depth step four that I was a pin cushion and the world was pins. Something happens, I feel bad. When you X, I feel Y. As though literally nothing is happening in between. So one of the other speakers this weekend talks about life being fired at you from a point-blank range. And the bullet goes in before you can see what's happened. But if you were to slow it down, there's this whole processing that happens at a below the level of consciousness, which is causing the bullet to go in in the first place. What I discovered, the reason something affects my pride when... Um, uh, so I translate, I do translations as part of my career. And um, I remember a client saying, it was a 10,000 word translation. I'd done it in two days. It was a rush job. And the the client feedback was something like, uh, your, the translation was great, but it was marred, marred by these four problems. And they were like tiny little things. But of course, I'm an overreactor to things. Now, why does this affect my pride? My pride is affected when I'm worried about what you think about me. Now, I thought it's because I had low self-worth, and I did on one level. That's another question. We'll come to it later. But the reason why something affects my pride is because I want you to see me a particular way, and I think you see me another way. There's a gap between the two. Boom, I'm upset. How do I want you to think of me? I want you to think of me as literally the most perfect person you've ever met. <laughs> is that the voice of low self-worth, or is that the voice of hubris, of entitlement, of wanting to be special to such a degree that the light is just on you and everyone else is in the darkness? That's something other than low self-worth. It's feels like low self-worth. It feels like you're standing on this tiny island and this huge shark is coming to chomp the last bit of dry land and you'll, you're going to drown. That's what it feels like. But behind those touchy moments is this demand that I be the center of the world, that I be the center of attention, that I have created myself and turned myself into this special being loved and respected and adored and validated by everyone to the superlative degree at all times. That's the demand. I didn't stop getting upset by stuff until I started to look at the demand. My demands, it's like a minefield where I lay the mines everywhere in the world. Each demand I have, I can only be okay if finish the sentence in less than 15 words. I can only be okay if they think I'm amazing, if I achieve my potential, um, if she returns my phone calls, if he gives me the guidance I want. I can only be okay if uh, my house is paid off, if I have savings in the bank, if the economy doesn't tank, if the environment doesn't collapse, if I, I can only be okay if I achieve something in the world, if I have a career that other people say, oh, that's impressive. I can only be okay if, and there are the thousand demands. Whilst those demands are there, I can forgive whoever I want, but the landmines are still there. When you step on the landmine, I blow up. And it's somehow your fault. I'm the one that's laying the landmines. 
My sponsor's sponsor says, the only reason you're ever upset is because you haven't got your own way. The only way not to be upset is not to have a way. If you don't have a way, there is nothing to be upset by. That's what those first three columns are about, is uncovering all of those demands in the seven areas of self, pride, what other people think about me, self-esteem, what I think about me, personal relations and sex relations, how I insist you treat me. I used to say people just don't respect me. No, as people have explained to me repeatedly, who cares? Who knows, who cares whether they respect you? Your problem is they don't agree with you and they don't obey you. <laughs> and if that's at home, if this is going on in the people in your family and you think you're not getting respect from people in your family, you know, you, you take that idea of obedience and imitation and agreement. Uh, I wanted loving relations with people, but if I've got demands, I'm a little tin pot dictator, and you are the slaves. And there is surveillance everywhere I'm watching very closely. <laughs> and I'm the one, by having a demand against you, I've put you over there, and then I feel like you've abandoned me. If there is a sense of separation between me and you, it is happening in my own mind because I think you're over there and I'm over here and you have something I want and there's, there's a transaction here. You're the delivery system for what I want. That's the problem. This sense of separation came from me setting my, myself up at the center of the world like Jabba the Hutt wanting everything to be sucked in my direction and then I'd be okay. And everybody's people were enemies or they were delivery systems. There were no relationships. And then you have a drink and the barriers come down. And for a moment you feel some, some kind of sham intimacy. And if you've ever been with some people who are drunk with the sham intimacy and you realize there is nothing real, the next day they're going to be shouting at each other again. That intimacy was not real. Anyway, back to step four. <laughs> so with those first three columns, what I discover is that I need to drop the demands. And the reason it's okay to drop the demands is if you got your own way, you wouldn't be happy anyway. Let's make a list of all the times you got your own way. How, how many times at your home group do you have everyone love you except one person at the back who... Who sits there with his with his arms above his you know his head propped back with his arms against the wall, just shaking his head when you're sharing, <laughs> and that's the one person you care about. You have enough love in the room, seriously. <laughs> there is no genuine. There is no genuine lack. You're lonely on a planet of seven billion people. You're the problem. <laughs> it's okay to drop the demands because there is another way to live. And I, but I have to decide I do not like how I feel when I live with these demands. If I don't like how I feel, there is hope. I can say, if I'm upset, I hope I've been wrong. If you're right, you're really banjoed. There's nothing you can do. If you're wrong, there is hope. So I hope there is a different way to look at this. I would like there to be a different way to look at this. Maybe there is a different way to look at this. What can I lose by asking? If what you've got is killing you, you have nothing to lose by asking except this monstrous self which you're so attached to but that is the the monster stuck to your face but you've got to see that it's a monster before you're willing to drop it and there's a curious thing I'm the same person I was when I was seven just lots of the illusions have dropped but I feel like the same person uh, I feel the same person as I was when I was 22, except lots of parts of my body don't work anymore. That's the, <laughs> but I feel 
there's something seriously wrong here. But I'm the same person. I haven't lost anything by dropping self. Nothing has gone except the delusions. My motivation for getting over resentment, for getting over upset is threefold. First of all, it's futile. It doesn't, me being upset does not change anything. Secondly, it's fatal because I will drink again. And if ever you want to know whether you're close to drinking again, ask yourself, this is what people suggested to me. If you're exhibiting any compulsive behavior in any, any other area of your, of your life, any other area where you are not acting in accordance with your own best interests, those, for me, are the warning signs that a drink is on its way. And the reason is always conscious separation. The answer is always conscious contact with God, which means conscious contact with you. And the third one is embarrassment. The idea that my emotional life is governed chiefly by the bad behavior of the people in the world I respect the least. Anyone I'm writing in the first column of my resentment inventory, I'm putting, I'm giving the keys to the car. But if you change my perception of the world, or rather, if my interpretation of what you're doing is changing my perception of the world, it changes how I behave. I'm literally putting you in charge of how I behave. And I don't want that anymore. And the basis of forgiveness, um, it doesn't use the term forgiveness uh, in that part of the big book, 66, 67, but I can't think of what else it is. Um, it asks me to say some prayers. Now, before the prayers, I've got to look at things from an entirely different angle. That entirely different angle is when I'm mean to people, someone spoke about it very well last night, when I'm mean to people, it's because I'm frightened. When I'm grasping, it's because I'm frightened. When people do things to me, they're not doing things to me. They're doing things in my presence because they're frightened. And the response must always be the same, which is to love people. But it's not about me. He was an asshole before he walked into the room. He's not being the way he's being because you're there. He was like that already. Um, to extend to other people the realization that when I'm gripped by ego, when I'm gripped by self, I'm not in the driving seat, I'm in the passenger seat. I'm, it talks on page 62 about being driven, literally being driven. If I'm being driven, I'm not in the driving seat. But I think I am, which is why I feel so guilty about it. So to extend this realization, I'm either guilty or I'm powerless. With my alcoholism, the guilt went when I realized my powerlessness. While I was still feeling guilty, it meant I hadn't recognized that I was powerless over it. And I extend this to other people and say, they're not guilty, they're powerless. My other half says about all sorts of people who are, you know, full-grown adults, he can't help it, he's only little. <laughs> or he's like a, a, a beagle with bacon. They just he cannot resist. This is forgiveness, is the withdrawal of judgment and with the replacement of judgment with understanding. Because I don't if I want to feel love love, I have to stop withholding love from other people. If I withhold love from one person, I'm withholding love from everyone, and then I feel like you're withholding love from me, and now it's your fault again, and we go around in a circle of increasing, increasing separation. And those prayers on 67 unfortunately work. I don't pray for other people's well-being in the world. I don't pray for other people's material lives. I ask God to save me because I'm the one that's in trouble when I'm resentful. Um, being able to take a kindly and tolerant view of other people comes, in my case, through prayer. 
when I say enough and with enough sincerity, please show me how to take a kind and tolerant view. And the, I realize I've not seen you. I've built up a picture of who I think you are, and that's sitting in front of you like a mask. And when I pray that prayer consistently enough, the mask drops and I see the human being. When I'm taking people through step four and when I go through step four myself, once we do the third, once we finish the third column, we spend a lot of time on pages 65 to 67 systematically seeing through the delusions of the demands which lie at the basis of all of the upset. We systematically go through and forgive people by with not saying you're a terrible person, but I'm going to rise above it because that does not remove the problem. That increases the separation. To forgive people by withdrawing the judgment and acting lovingly towards them. So someone spoke about it again very well yesterday, that sometimes you lead with the left foot, sometimes you lead with the right foot, sometimes you lead from the inside out, sometimes you lead from the outside in. Very good speaker says the steps don't care why you take them. They'll work anyway. But I've seen people work the steps, but still desperately trying to hold on to their old belief system, and they're just paddling in the shallows, and nothing changes, and then the program doesn't work. Well, it, of course it won't if you still think you're right about everything. That's why it's not working, because I know from my experience, whenever I say it's not working, it's because I still think I'm right. And when my sponsor says all is well, I think he's wrong, so I'm wiser than him. My so-called mistrust of other people is actually simply my audacity believing that I'm the wisest person I know. My misery is justified. My unhappiness is justified. And it's not. And then on page 67, there's a bunch of other there's a bunch of other questions. What were my mistakes? Um, where was I selfish? Where was I self-seeking? Where was I frightened? Where was I dishonest? Where was I to blame? Uh, what are my faults? Which gives me my character defects for step six and seven? Uh, what are my wrongs? Which gives me my harms for steps eight and nine? And here's the thing. It says, page 67, so you've got your list. Great. Let's disregard the list. <laughs> Put the list away. Disregarding the wrongs others had done us. What were my mistakes? I now have a completely fresh sheet of paper. So I'm asking those eight questions, not just about the people that I've resented or been upset by. I'm asking across the whole of my life. What is my relationship with... What, what, where are my mistakes in my relationship with food, with sex, with romance, with money, with politics, with my neighbors, with all sorts of things which may not make it into those first three columns. Um, the mistakes, one exercise I was given with that question, what are my mistakes? Write a list of all of the things left undone, all the things you could have done, all the things that you feel scratching at the back of your mind, but push away. And once I made a list and there were 70 or 80 things in my life which needed urgent attention, none of which I was paying attention to because I was so busy, fix, change, control, everyone else. Those eight questions will reveal everything I need to know about me, but I need to be at peace before I can ask, answer them honestly. Whilst I think that my life is your fault, I'm not going to answer those questions honestly. Um, the fear inventory, I used to do very elaborate fear inventories. I used to pirouette inside my fear inventories. Sponsees would get lost in iterative loops of endless questions which turn back on themselves, like the, the, the dog eating its own tail. Um, and mercifully, um, I've uh, started to keep it simpler again. And... The instructions are, are, are disarmingly simple, as are most of these instructions. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, even though we had no resentment in connection with them. Um, 
So it's not really asking for any analysis. To me, that is a list. What are you frightened of? I'm frightened of do a list. It honestly takes me about 15 to 20 minutes. We're not talking years of delving here. Like, it's there. And then it circumvents the whole need for analysis because it says we asked ourselves why we had them. And you're like, oh, great. This is where I get to analyze. This is where I get to delve. This is where I get to ponder some uh, great complex system going on within me. And it, it's, it's almost a, as though it knows we're going to try and do that. So it gives us the answer. And you're like, damn, I thought I was going to spend a few months on this. And it gives you the answer. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? <laughs> so I don't analyze anymore. I sit with that one idea. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Now, that can be understood in all sorts of ways. When I try to... Uh, I, I've had jobs where I refuse to ask for help, and I try to figure everything out on my own. I mess things up, and the very thing that I was frightened of comes about. So there are lots of examples in the material realm where when I rely on myself rather than on a higher power uh, or on other people, things mess up. But it's talking globally about all of my fears. So it's got to include fear of car crashes, fear of death, fear of... Uh, disease, fear of loved ones dying. If it doesn't work for everything, it's of no use. Something that Chuck Chamberlain says in a new pair of glasses, if there's one problem that God can't solve, I might as well just end it now. And I understand that. The one thing I can't accept is like a stone in my shoe. And after a while, that tiny stone in my shoe is enough for me to just say, I can't be bothered with a lot of it because it's all I can think about. So what is this self-reliance, which is the answer to all of my fear problems? If I am a physical body, I'm psychotic not to be frightened because it's going to break, it's going to die or cease to exist, and everything that I think I've achieved will be nothing. You read Marcus Aurelius, you read the Stoics, you read that the, the hot, I mean, even in, even in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, I mean, the short version of Ecclesiastes is it's all a waste of time. It's just a complete waste of time. Forget it. It's a waste of time. Stop trying. Stop. Stop. <laughs> if I am my physical body, if I am my material circumstances, if I am my career, if I am the people around me in their material sense, all of those things can be hurt. If I'm frightened, it's because I think something can be taken away from me. Whilst I'm attached to anything in the material realm, I have to be frightened or numbed out. Those are the two options, which explains totally why I kept getting drunk and doing all sorts of other neat things for which there are 12-step fellowships available. Because they numbed me out. They gave me this lo like low hum where for a while I wasn't aware of the fact that the whole thing was pointless. Except the whole thing isn't quite pointless because what I've... How I see things now, what all of the people who've shown me anything... And I haven't come up with anything myself. Everything I know, someone has taught me or shown me. I've learned it through my experience, but the experience has come from what people have shown me how to do and applying the ideas they've given me. That's where my experience comes from. If what I've learned means anything, it means that who I am, this is why I'm the same person as I was when I was 7 and 22. Who I am is beyond the material world. Who you are is beyond the material world. My physical body, a friend of mine says, is my temporary communication device. Annie L. says that death is a fairly major change of address. <laughs> so I happen to be running around in this particular physical form. But whilst I think that's all there is, I'm going to be frightened. To not be frightened, I have to see through that. I have to actually live that line, head in the clouds, with God, feet on, my, on the earth with other people. The work is here. The communication device has to be used. 
but that's not who I am. And when it says we were reborn in step three, to me, that's what it means. I resume my original place in the universe, which is I am part of a universal universal consciousness. And it's bang in there in, in concept one, the idea of this universal consciousness which is in charge of everything. And I've been delegated some tasks in concept three to do some stuff in the world. But it's not, it's not the career. It's not even the family relationships. It's the love that flows through those. And the reason it's a really good idea to always do my best and to take nothing personally and to make no assumptions. Uh, the reason that's a good idea is because it clears the channel for me to love people without being distracted by all sorts of other stuff. That's the point of trying to do things right in the material world. It's not for its own sake or for anything I get out of the material world. It's because it leaves me free to look you in the eye and say, it's fine. We're fine. Um, I'm going to say something about the sex inventory. I'm going to say something about step, something about step five. My relationships, and for anyone listening on a tape, that had inverted commas around it. My relationships for many years, my so-called intimate relationships, they were, not, they were not intimate. They may have looked intimate. They were not intimate. I was trapped in my own little world. But anyway, my intimate relationships for, during my drinking for many years after were based on a false premise. They were based on the idea there is something deeply wrong and lacking with me. But, gee, do you look cute. <laughs> there is something which makes you glint across the room. I can sense you, you know, the special one, coming. I can sniff you out through lead. So the deal is this. I'm going to exchange my brokenness for your wonderfulness and conceal from you that that is what I'm even doing. So I have to put on this front that I'm as special as I think you are. Deep down inside, I would think that I would know I'm giving you a really bad deal. <laughs> Feel guilty about that repress the guilt, project it out against you, and suddenly there's something wrong with you. Why are you with me? And of course, they're doing the same thing. The horns of the head and the alcoholic ma match the holes in the head of the al -Anon. Those sick relationships were interlocking jigsaw puzzle pieces. Someone said to me once, I don't know how, how to have a, a healthy sick relationship. I've never successfully transformed one of those relationships. When you're in the desert, leave the desert. The selfishness in those relationships, yeah, there was lots of bad behavior. Um, I, I, by nature, I'm narcissistic and self-absorbed, and that's not fun for anyone. But the real selfishness was I was in the relationship to to fix a problem that wasn't there, to fill a gap that wasn't there. So, of course, it was going to fail, and you were being used. Whatever good behavior there was on the surface, that was the fundamental selfishness I found out about in the sex inventory. Uh, my attitude to relationships is very different today. Um, uh, there's some wonderful stuff out there, and a particular rabbi whose material I read a lot says, uh, well, first of all, uh, good relationships involve me doing two things. The first thing is to forgive you for everything, which means to withdraw judgment against you for literally everything. The second thing is to serve you. And he adds, the only reason to form a, a close relationship with someone else is if you're lacking opportunities in your life to forgive and to serve, then find someone to settle down with. That will give you some opportunities to forgive <laughs> and to serve. But if you want something out of it, this is now a transaction. I'm going to bargain. And love is giving of yourself for fun and for free, expecting nothing in return. And when that's what I have on offer, I attract other people who want to offer the same thing. And the other thing is, is the unconditionality of 
uh, of a close relationship. Um, uh, another rabbi that I listen to a lot says, um, if you asked someone to marry you and they said, what is it going to entail? <laughs> You'd be like, forget it. If they say, since it's you that's asking, of course, now, what is it going to entail? You're fine because the agreement, the answer is yes, because of who is asking. And when I go to my higher power, it's the same thing. When I go to my sponsor, it's the same thing. I don't argue with my sponsor. I trust first and ask questions later. When my other half asks me to do something, I do it because of who is asking, not because of the merits of what is being asked for. Of course, don't do anything which is going to harm someone, but you just if they want you to do it, just do it. It doesn't matter that it's nuts, just do it. <laughs> um, for the record, I do multiple step fives. This means when I take step five, I take it with a whole sequence of people. Um, when I was about 15, 16 years sober, I did a round of step fives. I did a step four and then took the step five with, uh, I think, five or six people on that occasion. One of them was a bloke called Spiritual Paul in East London who listened to me for about 10, 15 minutes and started then just shaking his head, looking down at the ground, repeating my name slowly m under his breath. Now, that story from the big book, about how Dr. Bob took people through who was one of the first 100. This is the interesting thing. People say, you know, you had to do it right in AA. You have to do it exactly as it set out in the big book because that's how the first 100 did it. It's not how Bob did it. Read page 263. That's how Bob did it. Slightly different. Um, he listed his sponsee's character defects. Wouldn't you just love to do that? You're not allowed to do that today. <laughs> GSO have banned it, so you just don't don't even think about it. You'll be reported immediately. <laughs> but spiritual Paul, from me, had spiritual consent to say whatever he needed to say, and he nailed my character defects at a far deeper level than I could get near to. He's and one of his choicest lines was how many people in AA have you prevented from accessing a power greater than yourself because your repulsive presentation of the program has turned them off AA because you are so judgmental and shrill and hectoring? <laughs> now, if you think I'm judgmental, shrill, and hectoring now, you, I was a lot worse 10 years ago. <laughs> He gave me a whole new level. Now, I don't, I don't recommend, this is not something to imitate. He was a one-off. But my life went up a level because of that conversation. And behind it, there was love. And nothing he said hurt one bit because of the love that was behind it. This is why, don't try this at home, kids. You've really got to know what you're doing to pull a stunt like that. But that was the stunt that he needed to pull. And when I take step five these days, I do very simple inventories. I do very simple lists. Very often, uh, it's just going to be the, those eight questions on page 67, which will capture everything I'm doing wrong. I might talk a little bit about resentment and fear and a couple of other things. But I look at those questions and I find my, my best friend or my sponsor and we're through it in 10, 15 minutes. And in 10, 15 minutes, I can walk around the totality of the problem. And I don't need to learn to manage the anxiety. I don't need to manage the depression. I don't need to manage my character defects. I need to put my hand up and say, I don't want to live like this anymore. God, show me someone to help. And then the phone rings, and then the phone rings, and then the phone rings. And I hear my own story told back to me so many hundreds of times. I realize that you're okay 
even though you're telling me the most horrific stories. And then I realized I was okay all along. I just thought I wasn't. I thought there was something wrong with me. There wasn't. I had the wrong software installed. We needed to uninstall it first before installing the new software on top. And that's what Steps 4 and 5 are about. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.